Chapter 11, Geometries. Networks come in various shapes and sizes. The shapes can be treated topologically, but sometimes we may be interested in them from a less abstract perspective. Consider the angle of intersection of links. If links are joined in a 90 degree pattern, we get a rectilinear grid with a nodal degree of 3 or 4 depending on whether links go through or stop. If links are joined in a regular 60 degree pattern, we get a hexagonal pattern, and nodes will typically have degree 4 or 6 depending on whether links all join at nodes or roundabout or whether the intersections are offset to reduce traffic conflicts. We can certainly imagine other angles than 60 or 90 degrees. We can go from 0 to 360 degrees in principle. But these are less common. Smaller angles will tend to generate more space devoted to roads, since roads have a minimum width. Larger angles will sacrifice connectivity. We also have radial patterns, dendritic or ring radial, where a central node may be connected by many radiating roads like the 10 or 11 of central Moscow with a low average angle of 36 degrees. But other nodes are connected to only three trees or four ring links. The ring radial pattern, especially the tree-like pattern as shown in figure 11.1, increase the accessibility of the center at the expense of the edges. The hexagonal pattern lowers transport costs at the expense of using more land for transport and thus less for activities. The grid has a relatively high transport cost but conserves land for real estate. Real networks tend to combine these features. The grid varies across many dimensions, most notably block size. 11.1 .1, Grid Our networks are shaped by squaring the circle. Just as we have cut the round earth into a grid of latitude and longitude, and knowing that each block of one degree latitude by one degree longitude gets smaller and smaller as we approach the poles, we similarly cut our cities and rural areas into a finer mesh from that same grid. Much of this arises from the various large-scale ordnance surveys that took place in the Americas, Australia, and India. Grids date much earlier to Miletus and Mohenjo-Daro, among others. Not all grids are aligned with longitude and latitude. Some align with local landscape features, but most of the modern ones are. Even grids aligned with longitude and latitude occasionally look misaligned, as one degree of longitude at the North Pole is a lot smaller than one degree at the equator. Where grids of different alignments come together, interesting spaces are created. Not all grids are squares, most are more like rectangles. So why should we have 90 degree rectilinear grids? Proponents claim it simplifies construction and makes it easier to maximize the use of space in buildings, simplifies real estate by making the life of the surveyor easier, simplifies intersection management by reducing conflicts compared to a six-way intersection, and is embedded in existing property rights and impossible to change. We in the modern world need not be bound to the primitive tools of the early surveyor, the primitive signal timings of the 1920s traffic engineer, or the primitive construction techniques of early carpenters. And while, for existing development, we might be locked into existing property rights, for new developments that doesn't follow. Opponents argue the grid is among the least efficient way to connect places from a transport perspective, reduces opportunities for interesting architecture, and wastes developable space by overbuilding roads. The surveyor's plan of Manhattan, part of which is drawn in figure 11.2, was a grid. But the grid was differentiated. It set aside avenues which ran north-south and designed to be 100 feet wide, about 30 meters. Since Manhattan is longer than it is wide, there were many more east-west streets, exacerbated because the grid is tighter in the north-south direction than the east-west direction. The standard width was to be 60 feet, 18 meters wide, and the blocks were 200 feet, 60 meters long. But selected streets, 4th, 23rd, 34th, 42nd, 57th, 72nd, 79th, 86th, 96th, 106th, 116th, 125th, 135th, 145th, and 155th streets were wider, set at the same 100 foot width as the avenues. Some of these, 155th, 145th, 125th, and 42nd, eventually became the roads that some of the bridges and tunnels to the rest of New York would land, though this is not a perfect match. They would also tend to become the sites of stations on the subway system a century later. 11.2 Block sizes. Unlike Sir Mixalot, urbanists don't like big blocks. While many cities use topologically identical rectangular grid systems, the scale varies significantly from Portland at 200 feet by 200 feet, 60 by 60 meters, to Salt Lake City at 660 by 660 feet, 200 by 200 meters. Small blocks increase surface area and the amount of building frontage on streets. In the same area that one block from Salt Lake City has 800 meters of street frontage, Portland's nine city blocks have about 2,160 meters of frontage. This is much more interesting to walk around. The smaller blocks also increase intersection density and connectivity. 
For every Salt Lake block, figure 11.3, Portland has six additional intersections, figure 11.4. In practice, Salt Lake bifurcates many of its blocks with smaller streets or pedestrian cut-throughs to address some problem of size. The smaller lots enabled by the increase of street frontage are more affordable for home buyers. For cars, more intersections means more places for delay, but it also means less delay per intersection as traffic is spread across more and skinnier streets. Dispersion of traffic across a finer mesh grid increases reliability at the cost of average speed. 11.3 Hex In contrast with the grid, there are many designs for non-rectilinear street networks. Most 19th and 20th century designs are simple aesthetic choices, as in Canberra, the planned capital city of Australia, and don't seem to relate to deeper urban organizational issues. Rudolf Mueller proposed the city of the future hexagonal building concept for a new division, shown on the left in figure 11.5. Mueller's plan offsets the 60-degree streets so that they come together in four-way rather than six-way intersections, though they are still at 60 degrees and not bent to make 90-degree intersections. This ensures that the cells in the plan are not bisected by roads and that they are instead hexagonal blocks. This plan loses a lot of areas to ornamental parks in the middle of streets. Charles Lamb's city plan, the right on figure 11.5, has the streets hexect at the hexagonal cells. In this case, the blocks are really triangles. The hexagon is efficient. It replicates the closest packing of circles. Take a penny, surround it with pennies so that they are all touching. The central penny touches six others. Thus, following the closest packing argument, the hexagon, as geometrical shape, is not sufficient for efficiency. We must also arrange those shapes into an efficient pattern, in this case something more like the Glinsky chessboard, figure 11.6. So, although we talk about grids as being necessary for connectivity, we can get even more connectivity if we think about a variety of different geometries. No need to be square. 11.4 Ring Radial Radial networks maximize accessibility of the center. Ring radial networks nearly maximize that accessibility while providing connections between suburbs. Figure 11.7 highlights the primary street network for Moscow, Russia. Instead of a grid or dendritic network, Moscow has a ring radial street network. The circular bullseye routes comprise the rings while the lines converging in the center make up the radial. These circular routes are often called ring roads, perimeters, loops, or beltways, especially when they are highways. Traveling from anywhere within the region to what would typically be the central business district and back is relatively efficient. Traveling from one suburb to another might not be as easy as getting downtown, but is made possible by the ring roads. Ring radial street networks tend to be less common than ring radial transit systems. Again, such transit network designs often work well for downtown trips, particularly commute trips. However, cities and regions continue to grow and become more polycentric. Ring radials can lose much of their efficiency. <laughs>